Um, so I want to take you on a on the journey of an exploration of an idea I had last year. Um, and it all started um, with the generous donation of a data set, NC Water data sets. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Um, and I sampled um, a subset of the, that's got millions of records in it, and I sampled uh, two subsets. There were 200,000 each, uh, and they had uh, 120,000 um, entities in common. And I was trying to find a good configuration for generating clicks that achieves an acceptable linkage quality of some sense. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't successful with the tools we got at hand at the time. Um, and then I started looking at the data set. Um, and here I graph um, the, ch the changes of the common entities. And, and well, if you ignore the, the, the problems for now, um, what was striking is that most of the changes in, in the subset of the data set I've got are address related. Yeah. And so, and what's the problem with that? Well, so that's a, a lot of information and um, more than half of the engrams of an entity consist of address-related engrams. Uh, and so if the address changes, most of your engrams changes, <clears throat> and thus you, if you try to link on that, it's just going to not, uh, it's not going to be very nice because uh, we, with the engrams, what we're trying to achieve is correct for spelling errors. But it, it's not a very good measure if your address changes completely. Yeah. Then um, the result is kind of arbitrary as I try to visualize here, yeah, if you uh, move from Oxford Avenue in Bankstown to either Oxford Street in Blacktown or what, what's it, Green Avenue in Smithfield, um, you can see the similarities is just arbitrary. So, so um, engram similarity is not a good measure for an address change. Who would have thought? Yeah? So, what, but what, what? Yeah, that was my problem. The question that I asked myself, um, uh, and then um, I had this, well, I looked at stuff, and one thing I came across is that people don't tend to move very far. So although they move quite a lot, as we saw, they usually stay very close to where they've been because that's the area they know and that's where they want to stay. Um, and so I thought to myself, can we find an encoding of an address that the similarity of the encoded re um, encoding relates to the physical distance? Uh, and the other constraints I set to myself is I want to make, make that um, work inside these clicks, yeah? so this one-dimensional binary data structure. Well, so what tools are around? Um, and the one obvious, obvious candidate is locality sensitive hashing. So this is a technique that takes multi-dimensional inputs and um, maps them into uh, a one-dimensional um, value, yeah, like these buckets that I've put down there. So you can just think of it as backwards, you draw in multi-dimensional vector and it ends up in a bucket. And well, you can see where that's going. So uh, I was trying to use that and the most simple um, locality sensitive hashing is a random protection. So what you do, you span a protection plane <coughs> through your vector field and then um, you map everything on one side to, to, to one and on the other side to zero. Um, and one property of this protection is that the probability that two vectors are mapped to the same value is, uh, relates to the angle between the vectors. And that's exactly what I want. Yeah, with addresses, so if you think addresses on, on the globe, so there you've got like the angle in between. If it's bigger, then yeah, you want to have this mapping less likely. Yeah, if it's closer, you want to have this more likely. Yeah, and that's exactly what they used in a technology uh, in, in a hashing scheme called SimHash. Um, uh, and the idea is you just repeat the random protection lots of times, um, and then if you compute the Chicard index of those all of those values, then that approximates the cosine of the angle. I said, I said, yeah, yeah, I've got it. So let's evaluate um, how how does it work. So so how did I evaluate? So, um, I use lots of colors. Um, no. So I, I um, generated a random center point, like this, this uh, yellow X in the middle. Um, and then I drew a circle around it. And for each of those rings, I created random data points. And, and all those rings are like 10 kilometers apart. Um, 
And then I took all the addresses inside one of those rings, um, computed the, the similarity to the center point, and then put it all into a violin plot. So that looks like this. Um, and in a violin plot, so you've got um, th three ticks. So you've got the mean, the maximum, the minimum, and then you've got this nice little valley uh, that shows the density of, of the values within those categories. So we can see like um, all, all the addresses that, that were within 10 kilometers away were uh, super, super similar. And unfortunately, even the addresses that were like 200 kilometers away were still very, very similar. Um, so that was in incredibly disappointing, but when you start thinking about it, it's not very surprising because the Earth is kind of big. Uh, so even 200 kilometers, which seems like a lot, uh, a lot uh, big distance to walk, in the context of the Earth, it's just nothing. Yeah? So the angle is still like two degrees, and the cosine is unfortunately still one. So we need something better. So back to the drawing board, but drawing board, back, back to Google. Um, looking for some other ideas. Um, and I come across this paper, um, that's the exact Euclidean hash. Um, and th instead of using a random projection, they have something a bit more uh, fancy in there. And so, so they, they quantize the projection in a, in a way. So this um, W at the bottom is the quantization parameter, and up there, you choose a, a random projection vector R, and you multiply it against your value and um, quantize it. And then instead of only having zero and one buckets, now you've got like this whole integer field of buckets, which is really nice. Um, and, and then, um, but it still has um, this property that the probability that two elements are hashed in the same thing um, relates, uh, and this time, to the Euclidean distance. And that's exactly what I wanted. So great, yay. Um, and then we do the same thing. We repeat it several times to create um, a vector of values, and then we can insert them into a Bloom filter. And if we now look at the violin plot, da -da -da -da, it looks way better. Yeah? Um, what we can see um, is that close distances are very similar, and far distances are not very similar. Um, so I was very pleased with myself. Mm. And now let's go back to the problem I had in the beginning, yeah? The NC border data set, but the subset of the NC border data set that I had. Um, so how do I evaluate that? Um, I split the features into three groups. So I've got all the name-related features, that's one group, then the address-related features is the second group, and the third group is the rest. That's, I think, age and gender and phone number. Uh, then I uh, inserted them into Bloom filters where each of those groups flipped 200 bits. You have to have like kind of um, uh, equal, equal contribution. And uh, now let's look at the results. So baseline is where I just use the name features and the, the other stuff. Okay. So um, this gives you an F1 score of 0.993 almost. Yeah, so, yeah. so we're right, but not great. When you start adding the address as n-grams, it actually gets worse. So you get down to less than 0 0.9. Um, but if you encode the addresses um, with a Euclidean distance base, um, then it, it gets actually better. And, uh, um, and down uh, on the x-axis, what I didn't uh, label, that's the quantization factor. So it, it, unfortunately, it's another parameter to tune. But I mean, it's fairly obvious, it's like it relates to the distance, and uh, you have to tune it to your data set, so look how far your addresses are apart, um, and you get this nice curve, and I got a really nice increase. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So, conclusions. Uh, so, we can actually encode multi-dimensional features into a one-dimensional Bloom filter, yeah, and preserving the distance relationship. And this does not only work for two-dimensional ones, it can be uh, n-dimensional, um, so, so those localities and the hashing functions. Yeah, spend to lots of things. And why is that important? That's important because pretty much all the collected data that uh, companies have is somewhat personally identifiable. Uh, and as we learned before, uh, from the talk before, 
the feature that they usually use for, for linkage, uh, so the standard features like dress and phone number and stuff, they're not very stable, unfortunately. Other things, um, like your behavior is way more stable, like the way you walk or the way you talk, or how you look like, all this kind of stuff, is way more stable. And I think this would be a, um, a technique to enable linkage on, on, on more interesting personal features that are more stable. Thank you. Right. Questions? Yeah. So we know that young people move more often than elderly people. Once they're <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I, so I guess a natural extension would be to combine demographic information such as age um, with geographical, and maybe can develop more complex models. That would be yeah. interesting to see how that would help, or maybe not. Yeah. So, so, um, so one thing, if you look at the data set again, uh, it, it's essentially the worst case that should work the best for my technique. So. I'll, of course, I tune it. Um, in reality, you probably don't have such a high um, fluctuation in, in addresses. So it's anyone's guess how good that works in, in other real world data sets. But unfortunately, we don't have access to many. So I did not test that further. And maybe there's even a, a mixture of things you can use. Like this is just another feature that you try to, to weigh in according to your data set. And you could even try to. Yeah, make it dependent on, on age or some other factors. And it's also like, I guess, um, postgraduate, postgraduates are more likely to, to change addresses than someone who hasn't got a, a good education. It's not more important as well because, I mean, Sydney to London is much more likely from Sydney to, you know, Kuala Lumpur, for example, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 Australia <laughs> really is a weird place, yeah, because it, essentially European countries just it drops off the, the map. Yeah. Um, but it, it might change, though. I mean, more and more, it's more likely that they, you go to China and back and stuff. So we, we, we finally find our place in Asia as a nation. <laughs> so, but we're getting there. So I actually have a question. Um, so I didn't quite. Um, understand how you go from addresses to encoding. Ah, yeah, okay. An, an address can be uniquely de uh, described by two values, latitude and longitude. All right, so you just do the geocoding. Yeah, yeah just the geocoding. So I, I ran, I fed my NZ loader data set into the geocoding service and got the, the coordinates back. And where does the random projection come in for the two numbers? So the, the random projection, this stuff, yep. will come, come in. Is it used? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I experimented with this. That is it's not, not mine. So the team hash and E2 hash. So some, someone it's else's papers. Huh? So, so my question is, you have addresses which you joke into two numbers. Yeah. At what point do you apply random projection? Yeah, one, once I've got it, there's a vector of a longitude latitude. So this is this is my, my space. Which is two-dimensional. So two-dimensional, and then we reduce it into one dimension in a way that um, the encoding still preserves the distance. But so if you have two numbers, why not just work with the two numbers? Um, <laughs> so if you take Peter's idea, like encode each number as a range, and then just encode that into the Bloom Fielder, so that preserves all the information, <coughs> there, right? Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't relate directly to the um, Euclidean distance. Okay. If you, if you treat them separately, and, and if you add then another dimension or even, yeah, even more than that, then it just gets even weirder. But uh, you really have to, to try to approximate the distance between those points. So usually, I mean, you do random projection when your original dimension is quite high. But yes. in this case, your dimension is two it's dimensions. Time. Yes, exactly. Okay. But, uh, well, it, it, I mean, it was just an exploration, and it, it worked, which is, well, I, I found it, um, Exciting because um, if you think about it, it's not that, um, that clear to me that it actually gave an, an uplift in the end. Uh, because um, it, traditionally in linkage, you try to to, to create this, this tiny peak yeah, with the, the one entity that you want to link against that's the same, and you, you try to get it as down as possible with all the other ones that are non matches. Where in, in this technique, you create this huge shape a curve with, with all the people out there that live nearby. And, so, yeah, it was surprising to me that it worked that well, but yeah, it's 
Cool. Going back to the question for Dinusha just now, I mean, the question was the dice versus the cosine distance, right? So is this the way to... Well, this is more like a... I mean, if you st I've actually used Simhash recently for a new similarity-based attack, which I'm going to briefly mention this afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, it was more like a blocking technique, right? So I mean, this, yeah, actually, I'm going to... Yeah, yeah. I, I know, yeah, you can I mean, use... There's lots of different ways of how you... I'm, I'm even using this for a single similarity to hash it into a binary vector, and then you use that as a kind of a blocking, yeah. uh, uh, humming-based blocking technique, right? So, but then afterwards, I'll then calculate the proper distance, in my case. But I can see that, you know, where you put them into that binary space, and if you have the binary space, you cannot get the address back. That's, again, that's the privacy-preserving aspect, I think, right? So it's not a sort yeah. of blue book, it's, it's representing a, I use this one, we present a, a point with a binary vector. Right. Having the binary vector doesn't really allow you to get, well, I don't know, that's nobody's attacked that, right? If you have such a hash binary value, because in a way, if you look at the random projection, you must probably can re-identify pretty easily. Yeah, if you would uh, review that in the clear, yeah. yeah. Because you kind yeah. of cut the surface of the Earth and see what they do many halves, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the intersection of that gives you very likely a very small area, and therefore you could re-identify. Yeah. That would be a nice attack. But, yeah, but, but that's, that's why I have reduced it to a bit vector, and then you can use all the, the techniques that you already know about how to treat clicks to make mm. them private. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, so that's one of the limitations. If you should relax that, then you can probably more easily uh, find a similarities um, way of computing, a way of computing similarity and stuff. But then you have to start acting about privacy again. Yeah. Okay. That's a bit, okay.